Okay, everybody, it's time for another Ask an Angel. Myself and Zach Coleus are going to answer your questions, both on the investor side of the table and the founder side of the table, everything in between. We talk about pro rata, we talk about the J curve, we talk about founders getting fired, getting screwed by downstream investors. When Zach's on the program, it's fast paced, and it's absolutely candid, insightful, important knowledge for founders and for investors. We keep it very real. It's 100 here. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Notion. Notion is one place for notes, docs, projects, and everyday work that goes way beyond a wiki. Go to notion.so and use promo code TWIST to get $250 off an annual team plan. And Odoo. Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of business apps that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever. And right now, Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. Welcome to another episode of Ask an Angel with Jay Cal and Zach Coleus. Zach, welcome back to the program. Always a pleasure, sir. Great to see you. Great to see you as well. How's your summer going? Oh, uh, you know, just living the douchebag VC life. Good, oh. solid couple months in Europe, which was awesome. Oh, nice. And, uh, Taking know, advantage of that remote it. work lifestyle. Let's That's start great. there. That's part of the job. Let, let's job. talk there, Zach. Um, VCs and yeah. investors have always, always taken advantage of the remote lifestyle, calling into board yeah. meetings, you know, taking six weeks in the summer to go to Italy, taking six weeks to go skiing. But yeah. now everybody's doing that um, yeah. to this day. So what are you seeing on the remote work front in terms of startups, uh, early stage, and even the more robust ones in your portfolio, and how they're dealing with either hybrid, going back to work, or staying remote? What are you seeing anecdotally? Across my portfolio, it's almost entirely fully remote um, with this, like, let's get together on a regular cadence as a group um, and let's have little pods that get together if and when it makes sense. But in general, remote. And it's really like what, the, what I talk to them about a lot is I'm like, look, you know, when in the early days of the manufacturing sort of era, it was figuring out how to make basically like thousands of people work together at scale that mm -hmm. enabled, you know, those companies like forward to win. And in this world, it's how do you figure out how to make somebody who's currently in Italy hanging out productive and make sure that they're not slacking off? How do you manage your people at scale? How do you manage morale? How do you manage information flows? How do you how do you do that correctly? And there's like a bunch of really cool companies out there. GitLab does some really interesting stuff about how to operate a remote. I um, mean, they've been doing that for years that have really kind of perfected the best in class around this. And I think every company in the world now has to figure out how to do that or, or they're going to lose. Yeah, it turns out information workers, the best ones, they're essentially, I don't want to say spoiled, but they've adapted to remote work. For some of them, it's a non-starter. They would leave a job uh, if they were forced to come back, as we saw with Apple, for some people to come back. Some people said, yeah, not, not for me. I'm going to go find another gig. So if you want to keep your people uh knowledge workers i think you're gonna have to meet them where they are uh now let's unpack one thing how do you make sure people are actually productive because you know it's one thing to have 10 employees and team members you can just talk to each one every day you can see them in slack but how does that scale and and what are the challenges people are finding in terms of people slacking off because we all know anecdotally we talk to our friends and there's always one friend at your circle who's like, yeah, I'm putting in two hours a day, three hours a day, everybody kind of laughs about it. Um, and who knows, maybe they're like the most effective sales executive in the world, and they can book two sales in three hours a day and go skiing, or, you know, mountain bike, whatever their bag is. And maybe other salespeople work eight hours a day to close two sales. So as, as managers, do we actually have to care that that person is not doing four when maybe they could? How do you think about that? Or how are your founders thinking about that as well? I mean, I I've always thought that there's just such a performative aspect to going into the office that never made any sense. Yeah. Like it's like everyone has to be together and everybody has to be able to see everyone else theoretically working. And like, you know, I was just dumb. 
Yeah. Um, and you know, it was great for lazy management, but at the end of the day, like management has always, always been the same, which is like, you need to track the performance of your employees against their, against their objectives. You need to, to engage with them and help them when they're not doing as well. And you need to reward them when they're doing great. And that doesn't really change whether it's remote or in person. It's just, it was lazy and easy to look over and say, Oh, they're at their desk. That means they're doing their job. Like, whereas now you can't do that. But like when they were at their desk, we know they weren't doing their job on a regular basis. And so like a good manager would, would be able to ensure they were getting their job done. And, you know, a happy manager would be lazy about it. So I, I think if this just is going to reward great management and it's going to punish those who were just kind of like clocking it in, letting their employees just sit at their desks. So I think it's good because startups are all about that, right? Like that's management. What, that's it's all about great management. And yeah. you manage, this is really challenging for some managers. I agree. Uh, even myself, I've had to look in the mirror deeply and say, am I giving clear enough instructions to people what success yeah. looks like? And yeah. am I myself time managing myself, my to do list, etc. So I think all managers have to reflect and all founders have to reflect and say, okay, how do we manage our people? Because you're right. Yeah. The easy hack was, okay, it's 930. It's 10. How many people are here? Okay, it's 67pm. How many people are still here? I did a good yeah. job. When in fact, there are other ways to look at good jobs, which is setting, you know, what are, what are the key results we need to see here in this business, right? Yeah. What are the what's our cadence for our product? What are our, when are our product releases happening? And then what I've started doing is everybody sharing their calendar, I share my calendar with my management team, they know, like, they're calling me if I'm not on a call, you know, they know my calendar as the founder CEO. Now, if people if everybody shares their calendar, then we can actually see what people are doing. And I think time blocking is becoming you know, yeah. the thing I've added to all my companies. And if you're not time blocking as an individual, you're probably not optimizing yourself. And so put on your calendar, like, hey, this hour is when I'm going to, you know, clear out my inbox. This hour is when I'm going to uh, do my calls with my direct reports, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, and I'm not saying fill up your calendar, Zach, for the sake of theater or performance, yeah. right? We're back to yeah, performative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't want a performative uh, calendar. You want an effective calendar, something that is saying, you know what, these are the important things. What are the one, two, three important things I need to get done today? And then reflecting that to the rest of the team and making sure your calendar is in sync with the with the goals. Um, and you're always going to have a little bit of leakage, you can have some people who abuse the system, and you're gonna have some people who do a great job. Um, but really, I mean, what does this mean? In terms of the operations of startups and the scaling of them? I guess is my next question for you. Because there are some people who believe you're going to build a better product when five or six people are in a room together. What do you think of that counter argument? You know, five or six people in a room, if you have a direct competitor, uh, Slootman from, you know, yeah. Snowflake, who's got, yeah. you know, a boiler room going and five yeah. or six product people in a room grinding it out. What if you're up against a maniac like that? Does, does this still apply? Uh, I think you always have to start with first principles in this, which is the first the first step is recruitment. Like okay. if you can't recruit great people, like anyone who says, Hey, uh, inferior people in a room are going to be great people remote. I'm going to laugh at them. Like, yeah. I, I just I, like great people are always the most important thing you can do. And so like, you go out and you find the best people you can find. And if you can put all those people in a room because they're all nearby each other, or they want to be in a room together because they all believe that that's the right way to work together. Great. I do believe that's more powerful. If, if they're all centered in a similar location, they don't have long commutes. They don't have family lives that require them to basically like, you know, work remote because they have to take care of other issues. Um, great. But I don't think that's true anymore. I think that people who argue that, oh, we can get the best people in the world to all work in the same city is, I think it's, I think it's just, I think it's, I think it's a hypnosis that, uh, of, of, of delusion. Like, mm. and it's great. I love that they want to go argue that on Twitter because people, people, especially people who are sort of retrograde conservatives love to be like, Oh yeah, we're going to stay the way it always was. They always do that reflexively. Yeah. So like it's, it's normal for them to do it in this case as well. But like if I was going to build the best X company in the world, 99% of the time, the best people are scattered all over the world. And I want those people rather than like trying I mean, to fit it. Yeah, this is like a great point as well. If you're trying to fill a sales position, waiting for somebody who lives in Austin or Miami, or, you know, San Jose to show up, yeah, could or to move and that, you're, now you're talking about three, six, nine months, yeah. hiring the next best available person globally. Now you're looking at four to eight weeks. 
And yep. so if speed is the driver of, uh, you know, performance for companies, well, you know, especially for startups, th that speed could be all the difference in the world. You know, if you can get three sales executives online, you know, in the next 60 days versus somebody else is going to take a year. I think mm -hmm. we know who's going to win that battle. Here is yeah. a chart. Um, I'm not sure who Castle is, but they're tracking, uh, you know, office occupancy. Uh, and oh, yeah, it's yeah. just showing, you know, when if we, if we look at the 100% pre pandemic, you know, it's slowly coming back and we'll, we'll hit 50%. Hmm. But it'll be I a permanent a reset. remote access company. They like they have uh, the technology that facilitates like keying uh, in the doors. So they have it. like the real data at scale. Got um, it. Makes total like, sense. Yeah. I yeah. think directionally it makes sense. And, uh, you know, there, there are going to be exceptions here. If you're building, you know, rocket ships or cars or you work on the iPad team and you're doing physical design. Yeah, of course, you got to yeah. be in the same room if you're managing the server farms and you have to rack and stack stuff like yeah, of course, you got to be in the data center some amount of time or somebody does. So uh, but this is also great for this really does advantage startups, the early stage ones, because they've now eliminated something from their to do list, which was find an mm -hmm. office space, get coffee, get somebody to clean the office space, get insurance for the office space, deal with parking, deal with people, uh, you know, having an office manager, all those costs were, you know, for an an early stage chart, even if they went the we work route, you know, they were spending just 6k a month or something, you're still talking about 100 grand. So you can yeah. swap that out and get a developer, right? You can get another sales executive. Uh, which I have a company uh, that's like crushing it right now. They're called Upflex. And they've aggregated all the co working spaces in the world, we work plus 5000 other ones. And literally like on demand, huh. you get access on a daily basis to any co working space in whatever city you're in. And so mm. enterprises will license that for their employees. And so they're like, Oh, we've got 10 people in Milwaukee who all, all work from home, but they want to get together this week and go into a space for the week. And then, you know, push button, and it's all done, manage all the security and all the compliance, all wow. that, that happens. And, and it's what's called interesting up is it flex up flex. Um, you can do it as an individual. You can get access for yourself or like I travel a lot. So it's great. I can push a button, get a like world-class coworking space in any city of the world. Almost. Um, is it subscription or it's just on demand? Like it's like hotel tonight. One. So you can do on demand, but mostly huh. they really are. They're really crushing it. Selling into these big enterprises because what the enterprises want is they're like, okay, I want to put 10 people in a room, but I can't have them from the security perspective going and working in a, random Starbucks, and I want to have visibility into mm. that utilization. And what's cool is that they're now getting all this really powerful data, because they're seeing where people are coming together and how oh, they're interacting, great. and like, all over the world. And it's like, it's so fun to watch that because it really, you're seeing this change in working behaviors, which is still very young, like even mm. in the last call it six to nine months, you've seen really interesting developments in the way people are coming together as groups and utilizing space together. Um, and I, I think we're at the very early innings of this. Like I, I, the, the work, the remote work trend is one of the biggest, most powerful, most interesting trends we will probably see in our lifetimes. Like it's just so cool. Listen, Squarespace is the platform where you can build or sell anything. You all know it. I've talked about it forever here on the show. We love it at launch. We use it for all of our websites, including RemoteDemoDay.com. You can see how gorgeous those websites are. But here are some Squarespace features that I know founders who listen to This Week in Startups are going to love. E-commerce, right? Obviously, Squarespace was known as building these beautiful templates that worked really well on mobile or iPads and, you know, being super affordable. But they have added some great e commerce features in the past couple of years, including inventory management APIs, advanced analytics, SEO, and they now have member areas. This is so you can sell digital goods, right? You have some masterclass you want to do on angel investing, I could put that up on Squarespace and sell it there. And if you build it yourself on Squarespace, you don't have to give 15 or 30% to other platforms. Think about that. Just move it over to Squarespace. That's what you should do. Go to squarespace.com slash twist to start a free trial. Use the offer code twist T W I S T and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And go ahead, you're listening to the pod. Say thank you at Squarespace for sponsoring this week in startups. It really does help when you tell the uh, partners how much you love them and go use that code so they know we sent you. Yeah, it, it does seem that the uh, management teams now that people I think I don't want to trigger anybody here. But people <laughs> basically are not talking about COVID 90 plus percent of people are not scared of COVID anymore. 
have opted to not wear masks. So if you're part of the 5%, you know, <laughs> tell Lorenz, I'm sorry, you know, other people who, I, you know, there's a number of people on social media who want to keep this alive. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, look, it's over for everybody claims. else. Like, look, I, I think people who have autoimmune disorders sure. and who are, who have significant, like, significant chronic disease like i think they have a legitimate reason to be really unhappy about what's happening they're just unfortunately they represent a small percentage of the population and their claim is not strong enough to get us all to change our behaviors it's just not going to work like yes. good luck to them but it's not going to work i think that's the pragmatic fair way to explain this which is if, <laughs> really sorry if you have this you know yeah, um, it's terrible it, yeah it's terrible but there are other people who've had this all along who can't get a cold in the winter and yeah. therefore they don't go on the subway in the winter or any other place they could catch a cold, right? They have to be vigilant. Um, and I, I think we normalize masks actually. So if I see somebody in a mask, I don't like feel bad for them or something. Good, if, yeah. if you yeah. want to wear a mask on a plane going forward, because you don't want to get sick because you got your kids theater right. rehearsal this weekend. Sure. Why not? I mean, I, I might actually consider wearing masks on like long over, you know, haul trips or something like that just for, you know, an extra layer of protection of getting sick or something i'm surprised um, that we haven't seen really good positive airflow masks like mm. becoming more normalized like yeah. when i used to do I, I used to remodel old houses when i was a kid yeah and so we would have these like for like working with asbestos or working with really nasty stuff we'd have these masks that would literally like blow filtered air that would go through this really high high powered hepa filter blow filtered air in and then mm. was really like you never really had to worry about like what you were breathing because it was always going to that giant filter i'm surprised you know we don't see that more normalized kind of like uh what is it bane in the spider-man movies who are yes. wearing that yeah oh like that yes the batman yeah yeah Suck. Uh, the not, suffering right? in your portfolio will be legendary <laughs> i love bane he's like one of my favorite guys i would love to go for sushi with bane or something oh the omokasa that'd be fun that'd be down it'd be great uh so other aspects of this that are working even th that work pr particularly well seem to be professional development um mm -hmm. you know using that as a reason to get together i have started mm -hmm. doing this with my team so in june we got to get or may we got together we did professional development for our investment team i'm going to do it for inside next just getting cool. some people together and saying hey let's spend a half day talking about why we do what we do the best practices but writing stuff down uh and the tools are the next piece so Mm -hmm. I think that's I, uh, one of the things I'm realizing is the people who shine in remote work are the ones who can maintain and write best practices and share them mm -hmm. with the rest of the team and train the rest of the team. This, yeah. to me, is a person who was underappreciated in, you know, office culture, but mm -hmm. now is becoming a critical piece. Yeah. If you can yeah. write in your coda, your notion, whatever your jam is uh, in terms of your internal wiki, if you can write the the training document, the best practices document, this is how we do what we do. Here's the FAQ, all that good stuff. When you write that stuff down, and you move to this write first culture, mm -hmm. then when new people join, and people and they're wondering, like, how do we do this, you just send yep. them the link, yep. and they read it. And they can you say, hey, post a comment if you got a question, but and here's the history of the page. What else are you seeing in terms of people who might have been people or practices that might have been underappreciated in the real world? uh yep. you know and in person that now remote is rewarding so one of the companies that i uh, i work with uh, is called twine um mm -hmm. and they just launched uh on zoom and what they do is they facilitate really uh fast networking sessions across a team so you can take 100 people load them into twine and oh. they basically enable really quick breakout rooms high quality breakout rooms between individuals and the, like a bunch of metrics and you know the best sort of networkers in the old days were the people that got together and got coffee together and they were mm -hmm. constantly reaching out to people in their office and outside their office to like figure out how to get together with them on a regular basis kind of like the vc job and now i think with tools like twine i think you can have these sort of like ways to kind of constantly get people to remember mm -hmm. that they have these coworkers and give them a little bit of time together and give them the ability to engage with each other um and I think that's going to be the sort of like the best networkers of the next generation are going to be the people who figure out how to do that really well. Um, help, so help it basically, I'm looking at the website here for twine.nyc. If you yep, want to go check it, it out yourself, it's basically like trying to recreate the water cooler moment moments. Yep. So they, um, and I've seen like a bunch of like little integrations and, you know, um, apps in the Slack directory for this, but they're using Slack as well for this, mm -hmm. which is, Hey, 
we're going to figure out how to randomly put people together. Hey, what's your favorite ice cream? Or tell yeah. me about, uh, you know, your hobbies kind of thing. And that builds fabric. And hopefully that fabric, then when you're working together as a team, will keep you uh, more in sync. This is why VCs would do all this kumbaya nonsense. Mm -hmm. And like, if you wanted to like work at a VC firm, I remember like, I don't know, you know, Tony Conrad or these, you know, the was it Tony? Uh, you know, like the true ventures guys would go on these like long walks with their founders and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's got to go for a walk, they got to go for a hike, whatever it is. Um, and it's just like, okay, uh, a little too much uh, kumbaya for me. But it is nice to know, yeah, pe people got kids what they do. Um, and this kind of stuff seems um, yeah, really um, well designed and for five bucks a user per month 60 bucks a year, if you have 10 employees and you spent 600 bucks on this, who cares? Like, I mean, that's what you would spend yeah. on one dinner. So it's one of the things yeah. I love about SaaS software. If you're in a remote startup, you need to sign up for Notion. We use it every day. We love it. We run the whole company off of it. We have some amazing internal tools. We built a database inside of Notion of all the startups that we interact with. It's basically our deal flow CRM. Notion is not just like a wiki. It has all of these database functions that I wasn't even aware of. And my team keeps surprising me with better and better features. One of them is you can just at mention somebody or you can remind yourself and set a reminder in the document. So if I'm writing notes on a startup that I met with, I can say, hey, tell me to reach out to the startup again on this date in six months, whatever. Hundreds of thousands of teams worldwide are already using Notion. And more and more often, I'm seeing people use Notion to share their company updates. It's really just changed everything for our company and it will change everything for your company notion.so and use the promo code twist to get $250 off their annual plan 250 bucks is, that could be a couple of months free if you're growing your startup. And if you want to send me your pitch in a notion document, just add Jason at calicanus.com to it and I will go read your pitch. And who knows, maybe I'll, I'll call it out here on the pod. But that's a great way to get investors is to just share a notion page with them with your deal memo. All right, everybody, let's get back to the show. And thanks to notion, you guys, and uh, gals over there, everybody at notion is doing a great job. Let me ask a question about the downturn. So mm, yeah, yeah, we got a downturn right now. Ripping. Uh, yeah, um, many different angles we could take here. The first one I want to take with you is, do you think we're going to see people canceling um and reviewing their SaaS bills and saying okay i'm subscribed to 12 SaaS pieces of SaaS software maybe i cut these four and i make it work with these eight yeah maybe i work with the bundle i go to the microsoft bundle where i don't have to pay for slack i get teams built in maybe you know i use notion or coda and i get rid of google docs or whatever i'm paying for google docs is pretty cheap but you know people are going to start looking at you know there, there's okr software you can do your OKRs in Notion or Coda, or you could just use, I have one very large company and they were going to use one of the OKR softwares and they're like, it's really expensive for the number of employees we have. I'm mm -hmm. using a Google sheet. I'm like, is that yeah. sustainable? They're like, feels like it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, whatever you want to do. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Sa on SaaS software? Do will we see some retreat in SaaS spending? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a, a portfolio company called Vendor, uh, which helps manage SaaS subscriptions. Mm. and um, yeah, the data is pretty clear on this one. People are very quickly like, well, like at the end of the day, like I think people were spending like drunken sailors for the last five years because raising more money was so trivial. And one of the places that money got spent was in software. Um, and you had it across the org, you'd have people signing up for all sorts of different random software that they weren't tracking and they weren't managing and didn't, it wasn't really organized. And, you know, the old IT guardians of this spend kind of were put to the wayside, which is good because they were kind of in the way for a long time. But now I think there's a re-rationalization of that. Like, let's go back. Let's look at let's look at where we are. Let's look at what's happening, and let's manage this this spend out the door. Vendor is v e n d r dot com. Is that the yeah, vendor? V e n d r. Yeah. Um, so we, basically, uh, looking at how they do it, if you've got under a million dollars in SaaS spend, they charge you thirty six thousand, which mm -hmm. would be almost four percent. If you have one to five million, they charge you eighty, and if you have five million plus, they charge you one hundred twenty. But they're looking at everything you're spending, and yep. then they're going to give you advice to manage that. Yep. And They'll save you that on day one. Like literally, right. like it doesn't matter. There's, I, I don't, I, I imagine. I wonder they should have this case study, but I imagine there's probably never been a customer who doesn't save more than they spend with vendor. Got like. It. Because, well, one thing that's really cool is they can give you best in class pricing, so you, they can go in to all of your vendors and say, "Oh, 
uh, guess what? We know that you charge this to all these other customers that look just mm. like this company. Guess what? You have to pay them that now too. And so best in class pricing in and of itself Got really it. It brings the leverage away from basically the the vendor and brings it back to the customers. They get to aggregate. And I think that's just so powerful. Um, all right. Yeah, and there's next. a bunch of different ways that, that to manage that. Save so let's take the next angle. And for the people who are in the YouTube room, youtube.com slash this weekend, we're going to take your questions next. So get a couple of good questions in for Zach and Hard I. Ones. Hard ones. Uh, us. Yeah. And just give us a thumbs up. We got 150 people of you, 150 of you watching 31 uh -huh. thumbs up. Yesterday, we gave away two of the This Week in Startups heated ember mugs. Uh -huh. If we get to 100 thumbs up, we'll send you one. And we'll send, we'll send one to you, Zach, too. So you can uh -huh. keep your coffee Thanks. warm. Uh, it really is a cool product. Um, yeah. It looks really yeah. sharp with the logo Are you on it. I'm not, but it's uh -huh. like my favorite. Um, it's my favorite gadget of the last year, these ember mugs. You, and must, so, you must really love it because you're, you're to hawk something that you don't have a little bit of a taste I know, of. People are surprised. Like, That's exactly, really a sign exactly. of, of indic of love. The good news is we have swag.com as a sponsor and they make them. So swag.com okay, right, slash twist right, and you right, can go well, make your own for your company. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll figure out a way to get paid. At some point, Ember mm -hmm. uh, will... Uh, We'll, we'll, they should we'll become sponsor. a sponsor. They should become yeah. a sponsor. They should. I mean, listen, we sell out the show, you know, every year, so I'm not too worried about it. I think like we'll be fine. An extra special sponsor. You know, one extra special you even sponsor. more. But and, we'll, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's get these questions going uh, from the audience. I want to ask you another question about the down market now that we're warmed up. Yeah. Uh, okay. We've been talking about, hey, take the medicine for six months. We've been advising sure, yeah. folks, yeah. you got to have more runway. Deals are going to occur at a lower valuation. And so first... Our founders, if you had 10 founders, how many of your 10 founders have actually taken the medicine and reduced costs and been thoughtful about runway out of 10 yeah. on average, how many have done a great job of accepting the reality and making the changes they need to make? And then how many, you know, fall into the other bucket of not making enough change and maybe sticking their head in the sand? The only companies that are sticking their heads in the sand are the ones that raise giant rounds Got right it. at the end of- They can afford to. Uh, they can, well, they could, they've gotten more runway and they're, you know, I think there was a bit of a head fake during COVID. Like when COVID hit, you know, a lot of us, me especially was like, Hey guys, get ready. This could be really bad. Be prepared. Yep. And by the way, this is a great time to lay off your underperformers and to yes. like, you know, really bring things back in line. Cause like raising money could get very difficult for the next couple of years. Yep. And then obviously the fed was like, you ink, ha ha, here yeah. go, here's more money. Go and for it. Here's a ton uh, of stimulus and everybody's yeah. going to be more effective because you can't go out. Yeah. It was a, yeah, a yeah. huge head so, fake productivity yeah, head and fake. sales went up. Yeah. And, and so some of my companies did lay off during that period and they were fast and they were aggressive and they regretted it. Um, wow. and so mm. yeah, of course. Right. Like, uh, you know, I, I think in retrospect, um, uh it, they could have kept those people on yeah because the I, growth like, was there but now yeah. this could be the opposite situation I, I, there's no question because I, there's who's gonna save us here like at the end of the day when you print trillions of dollars and you hand them out for free out of helicopters i mean pvp loans and like all yep. that like it, it will boost the economy that's how that works but th that is not gonna happen here and yeah. at the end of the day like in a best case scenario inflation comes back aggressively which i doubt and um uh things kind of normalize again but we aren't back to the boom times that we were in when money was given away for free and so i think all these companies were operating under a free money environment and that's gone um and you get you just have to you're gonna they're gonna have to change and got it so the majority seven eight out of ten i would say have taken the advice and taken the medicine then maybe people who can afford not to haven't if you had to yeah, put I a number the, major on the majority of the companies are raising flat rounds Mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure they extend their runway, they're lowering their costs and they're preparing for a, a multi-year slowdown in, in, in venture. Have you seen an uptick in people saying we're going to go into an M and a process? We're going to start the wind down process. I have not. My, my companies are not at that stage on average. Um, we don't, we don't really have any that are, that are really in trouble at this point. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they are, they're all well positioned to raise more capital, but and that's six. because why? Why is that unique to your portfolio? In your selection I don't know of if it's them? unique to my portfolio, okay. I, I, you know, I'm a relatively conservative investor, and in that like I, I don't swing for the crazy like let's bet it all on black and hope we get there. I'm, I'm much more on like you know I get involved when there's real revenue, real, real runway, real products, a real business, and so it's you can dial your growth or your survivability relatively easily in that sort of environment. Like we. My portfolio generates almost 700 million in annual revenue now. 
So there's like real meat on that, those bones. And so like, it's Got it. relatively easy for my companies to say, okay, let's dial it back. Um, so whereas, as an angel investor, as an early stage investor, yeah, if you invest in companies that have products in market with some revenue, yeah, they are much closer to default alive, as Paul Graham would say. And if you are a super risk taking, uh, or you're running an accelerator where they're pre product market pre product launch pre customers pre revenue, yeah. okay, you're going to have a lot more of these uh, slowdowns. Uh, these yeah, like, for instance, like one example that we saw a lot of uh, over the last couple of years is you had negative gross margin companies. So companies that were like, you know, the 15 minute delivery companies, they would literally bring a product to your door, and it would cost them more money they would make. And the argument that a lot of people were making was, oh, at scale, this gets solved, at which point these become very profitable companies. But until then, we're going to lose a lot of money. And I always looked at that and I was like, God, there's so many more ways to invest in companies that are making money on day one. Yes. And they make money on each product they sell. I'm, why would I go play in that world where at the point that the macro turns, I'm dead? Yeah. Um, now, some people made a lot of money doing that. Uh, not my jam. Before we get to the ad, it makes our team so happy to see our partners celebrate big wins. And I'm thrilled to hear about this huge funding round for our amazing partner, Odoo. Really great stuff from Julian and the team there, especially in this crazy venture market. So congratulations. And speaking of the market right now, being capital efficient is more important than ever. You know that if you're an entrepreneur and one easy way for you to cut costs is to run all of your SaaS apps on one platform. So check out Odoo's suite of business apps. Using Odoo means you don't have to have a bunch of different SaaS subscriptions. Everything you need is already on Odoo right now. All you have to do is turn it on when you're ready. And they only charge you for the apps you use. Odoo has over 40 main apps and over 16,000 apps from their open source community. All of this will streamline your business. No more issues transferring data back and forth. And you'll have one customer support contact across all of your apps, not 20. And here's the best part. Your first app is free forever. And Odoo is offering you $1,000 in credit on your first implementation pack. So go to odoo.com slash twist for $1,000 off. That's odoo.com slash twist. It's a risky bet to make because like greater fool theory in crypto or other places or Pokemon cards, yeah. there has to be somebody who values this asset that doesn't generate revenue yeah. uh, or profits more than you. And yeah. this is why all the companies, whether it's DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, have said uh, Airbnb, okay, you know, we're going to move to pro the profitability phase here. And, you know, a lot of those folks, Joker, Getter, GoPuff, great services, really interesting. Sure. It turns out, like, if your bet was, you know what, it's, we lose money when we do one, uh, when the when the person takes one bag of groceries out to delivery. We break even when they have two per ride. And when they do the third, you know, uh, and they can carry three bags when they take their e-bike out to delivery, then we make money. It's like, well, how often is that third scenario going to happen? Yeah. And that's the efficiency that some people deluded themselves into. And then when you're talking about SaaS software or some of the companies in your portfolio you mentioned, they make money on the first transaction, yeah. right? Yeah. They make money easily on the first transaction. Now, yeah. you know, does that mean Uber or Lyft should get rid of Uber Pool or Lyft Line as a way to, you know, increase the number of drivers on the road and break even on that? Probably not. Like, I think those things could exist to just keep the network effects going and you could make money on X and you know, food and on black, but uh, on black cars, but you, you really got to think this through and be thoughtful about it, I think. And yeah. so it's very important for angels to understand Zach's betting strategy. It's one I do with the syndicate.com. I don't like s syndicating companies that are that do not have products in market and do not have revenue because I, I kind of train young angels, you know, don't try to invest in pre product market fit companies or pre launch companies when you're starting out, because you can, it's gonna be hard for you to identify what signal do you use? How yeah. charismatic the founder is like, it's pretty hard to guess yeah. uh, unless you've worked with the founder before and they have a track yeah. record now that yeah. you can make a bet on that's easy but that's yeah. easy but the most of them don't so you know unless you have a vehicle like an accelerator like i have or founder university now what why are you making that bet because you need to make that bet at what like two million dollar valuation three million dollar valuation you can't make those pre-product market bets at 10 million can you uh, you can i mean you know when i a mod when i bet a mod and mercury uh, that was, you know, literally a mod's like, I'm going to start a bank. And I was like, God, I don't know anything about banks. Like, <laughs> but you're a mod. I love you. You're, you're a machine. Oh, so you based it on a founder knowledge. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was yeah, like, so, so that's, that's, the exception. With, I mean, that's a caveat. Yeah. Yeah. If I've known a founder for a long time, I will bet on them purely yes. based on who they are. Um, but I've ha I have to have seen them at work like M particle, 
you know, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, Mike Katz runs M particle, one of the best entrepreneurs mm-hmm. I've ever worked with. Like he's the kind of guy where like, he goes starts a company. I'm like, here you go. Here's free money. Or Jack yes. Chow started pace. And he was like, he, like literally this is a good example. So we were on a uh, clubhouse room back when clubhouse was uh, a, a, thing. <laughs> a thing. And, um, uh, Jack, it was me and Jack Chow and a bunch of young entrepreneurs listening to us talk about raising money. And I was like, Hey, if Jack Chow ever raises money, I will give him money in a heartbeat. Cause he was, you know, sure. the head of product at a firm and Pinterest and like, he's just OG, OG. And, uh, he literally calls me the next day. He's like, Hey, are you serious about that? I was like, yes, I'm in for a million <laughs> bucks. I don't care what you do. Done. Here's the money. And then, but I was like, guess what? I know you're going to call me back in the day and be like, uh, so then of course, like, like a day later, he calls me back. He's like, well, Max Ledchin wants his <laughs> piece and Brienne wants her piece and Tish Uh-oh. wants his piece. And I'm like, I knew that was going to happen. And then, and then literally like a month later, he calls up. He's like, well, we're doing another round. Sequoia is going to lead, but there's no room for anybody else. I'm like, oh, like, Sucks. like so painful. I, wish, painful. I wish the best entrepreneurs would just let me take all the money and not let anyone else in. But that's just unfortunately not how it works. Yeah, you know, this is one of the hard things about the business we're in is, you know, some of the elite founders can dictate terms. Yeah. yeah. And they have existing relationships. So the chances of Ev Williams you know, you getting in on the next Ev Williams or, you know, Jack Dorsey startup are zero. Yeah. Because they're going to put their own money in first. Then when they raise a series A at 100, yeah. they're going yeah. to go to a small list of trusted folks who they want on their board. And they probably don't want to announce the round. They probably don't want to circulate it. So it's hard, right? And yeah. so you, you got to, you know, take a decade to get on those lists. Let's take some, uh, I, I will say in my portfolio, I've had about a half dozen companies and we're talking about over 300 companies now um, oh, who wow. were, let's say from the accelerator zone, didn't clear market or cleared market with modest, you know, raises in a seed round, never got product market fit, but they were able to exist on the bridge round every six to nine months. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think the perpetual bridge. Yeah you know, hey, we're no. literally going to put a section of the bridge out every six, nine months for you. Yeah, that's no. gone. That's gone. That's and, yeah. unless you've got some, you know, benefactor who really has an affinity for you, I would assume that the yep. never ending bridges are gone, you get yep. one bridge maybe from your existing investors, and it's going to be modest. So plan yep. accordingly, founders. Yeah, yeah. we're se- I'm seeing that right now. We have a, a number mm. of companies who are raising what well, we're going to be very healthy bridges like tons of runway like like great and the demand from existing investors and new investors is like 60 70 80 percent down so like wow. they'll you know they'll raise enough money to stay alive but they're gonna have to like basically they can't be back in the go-go let's throw money at random stuff days they're gonna have to like they're gonna have to cut costs and they're gonna have to be more careful about how they grow because well, free money is gone the free money is gone. And I think people's betting strategy has changed. So we, yeah. you and I like to play the cards once in a while. Um, I, by the way, I want to start another poker game. Like we should maybe you and I should just start one because I have yeah. my loft. I got the poker table. I got the dealer. So ah, in the city, we should get like a little maybe are you playing PLO now or no? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we get like a little low stakes PLO game for the fun of it just to break yeah, people's yeah. brains a little bit. Yeah, easy, um, easy, easy peasy. <laughs> so um, one of the things I noticed was one of the betting strategies, we were all watching Sequoia or Founders Fund plow money into their winners. Mm-hmm. So people said, Oh, yeah, you own 5%, try to get to 10, you own 10, get to 15, you own 15, maybe you can get to 20 or 25, you can do some crazy old school venture bet, you know, like Tom Perkins did in the old days, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever Sequoia partner did in the 80s to get to, you know, 30% ownership in a company, right? They used to get to 40% ownership in a company sometimes. Mm-hmm. That betting strategy has now been removed from the market based on what you're saying. The idea that you can go to your existing investor and like, oh, you know, you don't need to go to market. Let's do an internal round. You know, the WhatsApp strategy that works so well for Sequoia, Don Valentine's strategy with Cisco and, you know, Atari and other places where they just build huge positions. I think that's off the table now. I and maybe it was overused. Like okay. we're, I mean, I mean, I'm actively doing that now. So for my under what when circumstance I, do you do it? Well, when the company's clearly winning, when they're well established, and I just want to own more and more and more of that. What I would mean, that I'm, look like in terms of revenue growth year over year or performance? Uh, it depends on the stage. But, a SaaS uh, company, a consumer company, a marketplace yeah. company. What would it look like in that Series A? B Early zone? stage, yeah. you know, three plus X growth gets everybody super excited. 
Um, you know, if you're growing over three X a year, people are going to get really fired up. But for me, mostly it has less to do with growth rates in the later stages and more to do with market position relative to competitors. So for instance, like one of, one of my companies is, um, very well established in sort of the sort of SMB smaller space. And they've got mm. 1.6 million developers use their product and they're, they're just like, they own that. You, their, their docs are the best and their tools are the best and their pricing is the best. And like, if you're a small developer, you use this product. It's like mm. game over. And there's a big company that owns the enterprise class. And th- that for me is a no brainer. Like I love that business and I want to own as much of that as I can get. Um, you know, but it really comes down to, to, you know, to trying to figure out who your winners are and, yeah. and being thoughtful. Whereas I, you're right, a couple of years ago, every company was a winner because they would all get marked up and made us look all so brilliant. Like, because everything yeah. got, got marked up. We we're like, well, if the valuation are. goes up, people were taking that as a proxy that the business was doing well. Yeah. And now we find out that some people just had very large chip stacks. They needed to put money to work and maybe they weren't being as thoughtful as you and I are, where you're saying, hey, it's this 3X. We know everybody's coming to the table. My new move is, okay, I know everybody comes to the table for the 3X. Yeah. Show me the 2X that's, you know, got the inconsistent performance, but mm-hmm. still trending in the right direction, but needs a little more gunpowder yeah. to kind of win the war. So they're a little underutilized. They're missing some key people, but I kind of like the, we're, we're trending towards figuring it out, but we have a lot to figure out. That's when I like to come in and slide yeah. in my extra million. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, because then you're, you're taking a little more risk, but not too crazy. You got a yeah. lot of outs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that scenario. Let's talk about first-time fund managers in a moment. I want to take a question from the audience first, Nick. So let's pull up our first question. Morty asks, how do you think about competition? Big incumbents and other startups competing in the same market or solving the same problem at the early stages of a company? Okay, great question. We do get this one a lot. How do you, Zach, uh, counsel startups that are going into a competitive market? And can you think of one off the top of your head? Um, so I generally don't like uh, competitive markets, like because when I think about it, like I, like I look back at sort of the competitive markets that I, like in ad tech when I when I was an entrepreneur, you really have to as an investor, you have to be one of the smartest people in the room. It's like when you go to the YC demo day and you look yeah. across the room and there's a thousand investors and you watch a pitch and you're like, "Am I the smartest person in the room about this?" So it's a autonomous fl- car. No. Uh, is it uh, a new uh, SaaS software for um, building whatever? No. Um, and 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 when I'm the smartest person in the room about that, so it's an ad tech company, and it, uh, some idiot from Abu Dhabi marks it up 10x. I'm like, ah, good, yeah, good luck yeah, with some that. Some dentist is like, yeah. you get five. I mean, I, that was when I knew like the YC demo day was they really stacked that audience because I was like, yeah. what do you do? It's like, uh, I might, and somebody was really young. They're like, yeah, my dad's a dentist and yeah. uh, I'm going to be an angel investor. And I read your yeah. book. I was like, oh, that's awesome. So yeah, okay. your dad's giving you money to invest. He's like, yeah. And I was like, great. Awesome. I, yeah. And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, yeah, it's going to be hard for the first 10 investments and maybe they figure it out over time. So competition, if you're going into a space that's already been won and you're trying to win and compete against Google search, if you're trying to compete against Google's ad network, YouTube's ad network, Facebook's ad network, it's going to be a you're going to need to have a significantly better product. And then one has to ask with 10,000 engineers working on whatever product it is at that company. Is there a chance that you're you're you magically figured out something on the roadmap? It is possible. Google did beat 11 previous search engines. It's just not probable. Is, is that I think what we're talking about here? I think I think it all comes down to differentiation. Like so if you if you were to take the 11 search engines that Google was competing against, they're, they are search engines, yes, but like at the core, search is a delivery of a product. And yeah. the question is, is how did they go about delivering that product? And what, mm. what did they use to deliver that? So yes. they all kind of played in a relatively similar sort of technology vector. And Google was saying, we're going to do something totally different that, it, and that, that will result in a better outcome if we can get it to scale. And it was, and it was very early on, like when you looked at, at, at Google's technology, it was slow and janky, but it worked better. And so I think- I Multiple think that's times better, two or three times better. Way better, yeah, way yeah. better. So um, I, I think that that argument actually works if you're gonna go into, go into a competitive space. It's like, we are doing something fundamentally different at some part of the stack that yeah. leads to a 10X better outcome for the actual end customer, then like we maybe can have a conversation about why that might work. But like, if you're like, oh, well, we're going to, we're just smarter than them, or we work harder than them, or we're like, 
anything that sounds any bit incremental, I'm just like, eh, I'm not smart enough. Incrementalism to make that. is not going to change consumer behavior or yeah. business behavior. People yeah. are creatures of habit. If you love your BMW, you're just going to keep buying BMWs. Yeah. Now, if a Tesla comes along and BMW doesn't have self driving and it, do, you know, autopilot, it doesn't have a battery and you feel the absolute, you know, uh, delight of driving a Tesla, yeah, you might change, but you're yeah. not changing for an Audi. Yeah. The BMW person's not going to an Audi, the Audi's not going to a BMW because yeah. they, they're incrementally better. So yeah. that is the issue, I think, Morty. It's a great question. Um, and, you know, there, there are vectors that you can go at things. You know, the, the Slack was not the first group chat app. Plenty of other, you know, hip chat existed, IRC existed, people were using all kinds of solutions for that. I think Slack just made one that had a great user interface, was much simpler and had great APIs. So if you look at why they won, it's probably those reasons. If you look at Notion and Coda, wiki software existed. But if you compare Coda and Notion to what yeah, and actually at Google had like some sort of wiki thing, what was it called sites or projects or something they had some wiki style knowledge base. And there were tons of knowledge based companies. In fact, just Notion and Coda made it so beautiful that people uh, adopted them. So I think user interface can be the thing yeah. that makes you win sometimes yeah. simplifying a product. Um, it's pretty incredible. But yeah, great question. And the other thing is, ver you know, that whatever the attack vector is, it could be verticals, you know, somebody creates something for a specific group of people that want something different. Uh, that could work as well. Yeah, so we saw that with HelloSign where they were broadly useful for digital signatures. And DocuSign was like focused on the enterprise and and really focused on all the enterprise needs. And mm -hmm. then but there was a number of really good startups to said, okay, let's go focus in on real estate. And let's go focus in on a very particular uh, use case and build all the technology around what yes. those people need in that vertical. And they did astonishingly well. Um, and so it's it really differentiation is is everything like if you can't if you can't really cleanly argue why you're really, really different in some vector, yep. you're not going to make it young and bankrupt asks, <laughs> what are the top young and bankrupt? Okay, what are the top buzzwords you're staying away from as investors right now? So I'll uh, expand it from buzzwords. But I guess themes, verticals, okay. business all, models, what are you saying? Buzzwords? Away if you bring buzzwords to me, <laughs> I run. I hate oh. buzzwords. Yeah. Just, they're just so lazy. It, it is lazy when people can't explain stuff in basic English. But let's go to verticals. For me, it's D to C direct to consumer. I love direct to consumer products. Um, and I guess an offshoot of that would be consumer electronics. I love gadgets. I talk about gadgets all the time here on this being startups. I talk about direct to consumer all the time. Uh, I love a lot of direct to consumer. But if you were to look at those two categories, direct to consumer, and you look at gadgets, consumer electronics, both of those are a race to the bottom. Both of those are low margin. Both of those cost a ton of money. So I have really become less likely, uh, maybe even completely moving away from ever investing in direct to consumer and consumer hardware. Now, a consumer or a business hardware solution that enables a uh, subscription I'm okay with. So I think I'm not an investor yeah. in something like whoop. But I looked at whoop and it was like 40 or 50 bucks a month. And I was like, Yeah, not for me for $600. I just want to buy my Fitbit or my Apple Watch and never have to worry about the subscription. But I do understand why whoop did that because whoops got to make the money on a subscription. Um, and so maybe they have a smaller audience. But if you can buy a, a tracker and a heart rate monitor on Amazon for 50 bucks, and going down or a, a camera on you can buy cameras now for $25 on Amazon, like security cameras. It's just really sucks to be in the direct to consumer gadget business. So that that for me is the buzzword or th I'll just expand it to theme or business model that I hate. One time hardware sales, hate, hate, hate. Hardware enabled SaaS, I have a great company density.io that's just crushing it. And so uh, and even cafe x moved to a subscription. And now they're actually by selling the units to people at a profit and having a subscription, they have a viable business now. So uh, that's what I'm staying away from anything like as a theme or a business model that, you know, over the years, you've just said, not for me. I mean, you know, I've been a crypto hater since it was nothing. Uh, crypto yeah. web three, like that whole 
Yeah. It's funny. Like I literally like anytime I see like a, an email uh, coming in from, you know, somebody <sighs> pitching that says crypto web three, I'm just like, I don't even respond. I just hit archive. I'm like, read my user manual. If you, if you knew anything about me, my user manual is all over my Twitter. It says I don't invest in that. And yeah. they still send me that stuff. And I'm just like, nope, nope, nope. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard with the crypto stuff because I do see sometimes smart people mm -hmm. and I see enthusiasm. So mm -hmm. you're like, oh, smart person super enthusiastic about it they drank the kool-aid okay entrepreneurs are weird yeah. they get passionate about things they change the world i want to believe that yeah but then i look at you know what their behavior is showing and everything is around the next grift the next coin offering the next nft drop and none of it's with the fundamental technology or delighting customers it's all about how do we extract more investment essentially through these proxies for investment that aren't shares in a company. And to me, it's just like, I mean, I just, I hate to do it, but I'm just like, <laughs> I just, the red flags are everywhere for it. me. And I, I just can't, oh, I can't deal with it. I mean, sometimes I even get this, like, I get it, I get two red flags in an email and I'm just like, no, 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 I don't want to do a, I mean, your product's not launched and your valuation's a hundred million. How am I supposed to reconcile that as it goes against every tenant of investing for me yeah where i'm trying to determine is this product real yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's very easy for me to archive those emails as well and if my team takes one of those calls i just tell them you know put in our, our crm system when the founder said they would launch yeah and yeah. then ping them two weeks before launch yeah and actually can uh, one of my producers make a note of that i want to make sure that that's actually the best practice internally so rachel make a note check in with the investment team for today's call and make sure two weeks before they launch checking with them hey you told us you're going to launch on this date wondering if you're still planning on launching on that date yeah. um because then that shows where we're super proactive that we're yeah, anticipating yeah, the yeah. launch date that's great and i gotta tell you nine out of ten times they don't hit the launch date and oh yeah five out of ten times when you check in with founders they've yeah. pivoted yeah we're not doing that business i yeah. shut that business down i'm yeah. you know so it's just is there anything anything under the web3 umbrella that has just tickled you a little bit just a little feather tickle on your neck, Zach. I mean, Anything so, that just made you go, ooh. One of the smartest people I know in the world is starting a Web3 company. And I, I told him, look, I'm investing in you. I'll, I'll invest in you no matter what you Antonio, do. Antonio, yes. Um, he's been public about it. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. He will, he will uh, potentially prove me wrong. I would bet on him. I would bet yeah, on him. Yeah. I would bet on him. It's an easy bet to make. Also yeah. be entertaining bet too. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that I really like, I gotta be honest, there were like two things I thought, I wish somebody would work on this. And then I said it publicly here for years and nobody's actually made any progress. The first thing was I liked the digital rights management mm -hmm. around NFTs or mm -hmm. digital objects mm -hmm. where I know stock photography is like a big deal. Yeah. Um, or stock images, yeah, yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. So if somebody started a platform where I could take 10 photos from my, you know, camera roll, I put them onto a photo sharing Getty kind of site. Mm -hmm. And I say, here's the rights. I want to sell the rights to this. I want to sell the rights to 80% of the monetization of this picture of Lake Tahoe to an investor sure, yeah. for $100. And yeah. then I want 20% of however it's monetized in the future. Yeah. And then I as an investor could go onto the site and say, I just want to, or even as like Getty could say, I just want to own these 20 images because we don't have any mm -hmm. images of, you know, Lake Tahoe or yeah, this, yeah. you know, yeah. people using a electric surfboard on Lake Tahoe. Okay, great. So now we got 10 pictures of Zuck using an electric thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And okay, I bought the, I bought the Zuckerberg picture or whatever. Somebody got a yeah, 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 you know, yeah, paparazzi yeah. shot. Yeah. That would be kind of cool to me okay. because I could yeah. see that marketplace developing and growing in weird ways and just people told me oh yeah there's 20 of them and there were yes there were 20 white papers everybody had the same idea yeah. nobody actually built it yeah yeah it's a fundamental problem in web three is uh, that nobody builds nobody yeah. finishes their products yeah i don't know we'll see we'll see uh, it's hard one, to one of my companies is, uh, yeah. kind of became tangentially involved in in the web three world which is a company called entropy so they use computer vision and uh ai to basically identify fraudulent physical goods so using a cell phone you can Ooh. basically like take a gucci purse and it says, oh, take a picture here, take a picture here, take a picture here, take Love a picture on this seam. And then because they've got this huge database of images of real purses and fake purses, they can tell you with really high certainty that that is a, um, a real or fake purse. That's called Entropy, E-N-T-H-U-R. 
I can't even spell. Great idea. I, yeah, I, I mean, but, it, but the cool thing that they did, which is super powerful, is they now have built a technology where they can create a fingerprint, literally a unique fingerprint of any physical object. So basically, a pair of Nikes comes off the assembly line, wow. and they take basically using a, a high-powered camera, they take an image of a certain spot on the Nikes, and now yes. they have a, a basically a, a hash that they can attach to the NFT that goes with those Nikes. And then the owner of those Nikes can be like, okay, they were manufactured on this date in this place. And then when you sell those Nikes, anyone with a cell phone can basically take a picture of that spot. They get the same hash. They can compare it against Such a great idea. the NFT and say, oh, this is literally this physical product. And it, it basically enables Nike to basically say, look, if your Nikes that you're buying don't have an NFT attached to them, they're fake. So if you're a Louis Vuitton, every purse now will have an NFT attached to it. They will say, this is a real NFT, a real, okay, yeah, a real And you person. think about this use case, it's Providence, right? You want yeah, to make sure, yeah. and there's there's somebody who's a customer. You know, Gucci and Louis Vuitton, they have a vested interest in paying for this product. Mm -hmm. Consumers get it for free. You got an enterprise customer who's going to say, yeah, every time one of these things goes off the line, we're going to take a picture of it and its serial number, and we're going to put it in the NFT, we're going to put it in the database, and now you have high-res phones. Yeah, it seems like a perfect case. Now, does yeah. it need to be an NFT? Of course, it doesn't. It yeah. could just be in a database. Yeah. But it doesn't it hurt be. that it's published as an NFT because it, there'll probably be close to zero cost to that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, they, they basically use this to power. If you're an NFT company and you want to add this to your capabilities, yeah. you can use their technology. It's called Brig, uh, uh, the, the, tech, the product that they have that does this, uh, B-R-I-G. Um, uh, or if you're Louis Vuitton, you can do it on your own blockchain if you want to, or you can do it on your own centralized database. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so so I I get sucked into this world whether I like it or not. But um, but yeah, I get sucked into it as well. But I mean, it's like as those kids are doing the startups in eight, but it it has an ICO, <laughs> it has a coin. Yeah, it's a six. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's good. I mean, it just uh, I stole that joke from Rachel. Well done, Rachel. This is yeah. going to be my new uh, Gen X, my my new millennial uh, Gen Z poster. Uh, thanks for producer Rachel. But I mean, StockX could be a uh, yeah. could be a customer of this software. Uh, I also do like the NFTs for um, membership and clubs. And sure. that to me makes a lot of sense as well, especially because then you could freely trade them. So I wanted to create uh, a poker room, like mm. a poker club. Mm -hmm. And so I want to create my own. And we talked about like this. Soho House. Yeah, of, yeah, 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 we, we talked, talked about, about this on the time. In San Francisco, it'd yeah. be great. Yeah. yeah, and so I wanted to create my own poker club yeah. where you could buy a membership for 10K and then, you know, we try to get, uh, I don't know, 200 people to buy it. And then we have 2 million bucks. We set up a 500K space. Yep. Maybe have a 250K a year operating budget. It doesn't have to be a crazy space. It could be a 2,000 square foot space. We buy yep. it, hopefully. Yep. Pay the mortgage, whatever. And then everybody's got a share. Yep. Or maybe it's not a share because then it, we'd have to only have accredited. But they have a membership. The memberships last, I don't know, 5 years or 10 years. So we come up with some time yep. limit on the membership. And then at that point, you do a smart contract to sell or whatever and then if if it's going to get sold somebody could buy the share you could sell it first to the back to the group or somebody in the group and then after that you can sell it to somebody else but the majority they have to have 10 people support that person's membership or something yeah, like yeah. all those kind of smart contracts out there just working could be really interesting you know um Unless somebody tries to do a hostile takeover, and then all of a sudden it'd be better as a centralized thing. I'm not smart uh, enough to play in this world. I just everyone, every yeah, people start going down this rabbit hole. I'm just like, yeah, it sounds super awesome. Good luck. I'll make my money well, over here on simple I, stuff. Yeah, I mean, I saw Kevin Rose is doing his own club, and then uh, Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. uh, did a club, Fry Fish Club in New York. They raised. I had the founder on here. They raised like fifteen or twenty million. Wow. Fly Fish Club, yeah, fr frying fish, fly fish, whatever it is. And then there's somebody doing it, um, producers, if you can pull it up, somebody's doing it in San Francisco by the Salesforce. So yeah, worst yeah. timing ever, but yeah. oh, it's God, some they're sort so of, screwed. <laughs> they're so screwed. They're so dead right now. It's like, uh, talk about zombie yeah, apocalypse. Gee, I want to drop 10K on an NFT to own a piece of, you know, Soho house no. at, in Soma. No, mm. no. No, I don't know if those people live here anymore. Sorry, no, it's gone. <laughs> I, it's they, the city has literally managed to just take the gun out, shoot itself in both feet, and yeah. then literally just shoot itself in the head. I mean, the, the well, I, mean was, I don't know if you saw London Bree was like, we have to build back downtown. I'm like, oh you, my god, you you guys you, went to war with the tech industry yeah. for five or ten years. You blame them for everything. Yeah, they left. Yeah, and yeah. now you want to break bread with them because they left. Like, yeah. They this see. is like the crazy ex-girlfriend who's like, I know I lit your house on fire and killed <laughs> exactly. your puppy. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. But I want to. I want to get back together. And it's like, yeah, yeah. You killed yeah. my puppy. Yeah, you. You, you lit my apartment on fire. Yes, you. You shot. You drove in my, my car bed. off the. Like, you drove my car into the bay. Yeah. No, no, I just, don't want to be back yeah. with you. No, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so it's bad. Like, but it's. I mean, yeah, it's so bad. I do like that we have a new DA. So oh congratulations. God, thank God. Uh, and she seems to be taking the job seriously. Yeah, I'm rooting yeah. for her. Yeah, I'm. Uh, bro I'm go, bro go. Fan right now. It's like. Uh, I mean, she did. She, I mean, you did notice she cleared out all the public yeah. defenders who were in who uh, were uh, infiltrated the DA's office. Yeah. Which, if you were to write a novel, oh my god, uh, about we, we can go all day with this. We should stop because we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna just like spin each other up ranting about know, San Francisco, and that's not what we're supposed to talk about. Angel, right? <laughs> Uh, I do think, though, it does matter. Like, it would be really good. For, I, I mean, okay, let's look at it as an investment. Sure. sure. Okay, you, you're you looking at San Francisco as an investment. Yeah, short. How close short. to the bottom are we? You're still shorting it. Sure. Oh, we haven't even got started short yet. as well. Oh, yeah. Think about this. So all the commercial real estate in downtown San Francisco, like we just showed in the earliest graph, is like probably 30, 30. That's like 30, 30% okay. occupancy right now. All of those buildings are going to go bankrupt. All of them. And the tax base that supports that, all of that is going to basically just grind down. And it's a long, slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. And the city, the city because has- Because leases are what on average? Those big leases are five years on average? Yeah, they have long, long-term leases, and, but they slowly, they slowly come off. And so mm -hmm. those buildings are going to go bankrupt. The, the city has a $14 billion budget that it just literally just blows money on $20,000 trash cans. That like literally, like literally the city is now placing trash cans around that cost $20,000 because it's had so much money. They could do so many stupid things and, and it takes well, and time for that. To every, kick in. Yeah, and then if you think about it, like operating like a startup, this is the startup that won't recognize that things have changed. Like mm -hmm. they literally will not take yeah. the medicine and say, okay, nobody wants to come here. Yeah. I, I had a, I had one of the venues we love to use beautiful venue. Um, inside of the mall on market street mm -hmm. yeah. uh, bespoke i think it's yeah, called yeah, bespoke yes yeah, a beautiful beautiful spot. venue loves yeah. using it the yeah, incredible great. team over there yeah. and they're like hey <laughs> jay cal remember you used to do this stuff yeah. i was like even i with as much uh charisma <laughs> as well as i could design an event even i cannot get people to come to san francisco fly to san francisco well, why would you? I get them to come to napa yeah I might get them to come to Palo Alto, yeah, but I'm not getting them to set foot in San Francisco. You guys screwed it, yeah. Like, and I'm really sorry, but I, I literally told them if you gave me the space for free, yeah, I couldn't make it work, yeah. yeah. Like literally, if you gave me a hundred thousand dollars worth of free space in AV, I still would say no. Yeah, that's how bad it is. So bad. I don't think. And then I do it in Miami. It yeah, oh, Miami. And yeah, people go. To everybody's like, like, yeah. Oh, you're yeah, doing something go. in Miami? Let's I'll go. go. Yeah. And I'm like, do you want to know what it is? They're like, no, yeah. I just want to go to Miami. Yeah, totally. Or, or, you or know, Austin, not, or New York, or or, or, like, or anywhere, or LA. I mean, LA's yeah. a little bit too. But I mean, well, yeah. you know what? But, if, yeah, it depends on the area of LA. But yeah. people might might go yeah. to LA. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, so in breaking news, yeah. it looks like London Breed is releasing an ICO coin. She's going to be doing dollar sign S F grow <laughs> and san francisco is going to grow again i'm still short san francisco short, i agree short. it's going to take super short th they're not allowing the the building of units and soma has five years of circling the the trash can i was talking to somebody who works in finance and their their company makes them come in three days a week yeah he said i was like what's going on with the traffic he's like well it's really interesting traffic is not as dead as you think it would be and he was talking about cars and i was like wait i don't understand it's the, it's a ghost town he's like it's still a ghost town but anybody who goes to the ghost town drives. Yeah. So there were a lot of people who would take BART, but now nobody yeah. wants to get on BART. It's too dangerous. Yeah. They're scared yeah. for their lives. Yeah. So they don't want to get attacked by a junkie on the BART. Sorry to use the term, but th let's call it what it is. Like these are yeah. people who are addicted to very powerful drugs and are not thinking clearly. Yeah. Uh, and you just can't run a competitive city in that regard. So yes, yeah, st I'm still short. Okay, let's take another question here um so yeah so i do like the nft as i i'm still liking smart contracts still liking nft still liking the marketplace business you know but <clears throat> hmm, a lot of work left to happen <sighs> let's take another question how much dilution after seed rounds turns into a red flag mm, yeah. what's the lowest founder equity before it becomes problematic i'll just i'm going to clarify the question to make it easier for you to answer what's the lowest founder equity that you would invest in a seed round or a VC would invest in a series A. 
for let's just say it's a solo founder or two founders combined equity. So, so in for, a seed for, round, for the seed? minimum, minimum for founders. If they don't own at least 65% of the business, I start getting worried because what happens is, is let's say they own, like they come into the seed, they own 60% of the business. And let's say we raise 20%. So they take 20% dilution on that 60%. So they lose 12 points. So now they're at 48% going into the series A. What's going to happen when the series A occurs is the new lead investor is going to look at that and be like, Oh, the next investor is going to be unhappy as well. So I need to re-up these founders today. So I'm wow. going to create a new, instead of a 15% option pool, I'm going to make it a 25% option pool. Um, and then I'm going to give basically, let's call it five or eight points to the founders to re-up them so that I don't get diluted in the exact same way by the later investors behind me. Got it. And so the more dilution you have in that early stage, the, in the new investor is going to either say, is going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do the same thing. And I've had to do that where I'm like, okay, I need, I need you to be re-upped or basically like I'm going to get yeah. screwed over by the next investor. And so that, and then I'm screwing the investors who came before me and everybody gets all pissed off and it becomes a really messy, messy situation. Because so, you don't want the founders to quit. If the founders yeah. start getting, you know, yeah. let's call it under 20% each, you have two founders, they're under 40% collectively, they're under 30% collectively, it's, it's fine for them to be at, you know, 20, 30% at the IPO, 10% sure, at the yeah. IPO, great. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. it's, you know, that's what Larry and Sergey are at, what, 11% each or something, yeah. Zuck at 20%. That's fine at the IPO, but you really don't want to get down to low single digits at the IPO, or, you know, I would say at the seed, I would agree, got to be over 50% uh at a minimum for the seed round and then at yeah. the series a yeah you're probably going to want to be 40 50 percent at a minimum here's a follow-up question should the uh equity grant that's given to uh you know maybe give the founders a, a fighting chance here should that occur during financings or should it occur at a board meeting because the thing i found that i don't like is uh investors using yeah the top off as yeah. a way to win the yeah, deal yeah 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 I, the, the only way you as an investor can make sure that that doesn't happen is you have to make sure that there's a competitive financing. You've got to make sure that there are other investors at the table so that that the, those folks can basically bring good offers and hopefully you have good relationships with them so that they don't screw you over. Um, mm. But yeah. Josie Martinez asks, as an angel writing small checks, one to 3K, how to best navigate due diligence without being overbearing or annoying? Great question. At one of the three K, you don't get to ask questions. Like you're along for the ride. You're just you placing get, a bag. You get whatever materials they have prepared, and you get to make your decision accordingly. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think that anyone really gets to start asking for new materials or new diligence questions unless they're investing at least ten percent of the round. So whatever the round size is, unless you're a ten percent or plus check. Like you don't get to ask for like, you can ask questions to the founder. If you, you ever, you get to talk to them, like obviously ask whatever questions you want, but you can't be like, I need you to do X. Um, Cause like when that happens and I'm leading the round, I just tell the founder, I'm like, nah, tell them to go pound sand. I'll take their piece. If, like, cause I, I just don't have, yeah. don't have time for people who waste founders time. Yeah. So you have to be realistic. If it's a million dollar round and you're putting in, you know, one K you're not even 1% of the round. You don't want to slow the founder down. And uh, now if you're part of a syndicate, Zach syndicate, my syndicate, any syndicate or some group that's investing, you can always ask the lead uh, and read the lead zeal memo and what they're thinking is but again, you know, I would say your diligence could be using the product, your diligence could be looking at reviews of the product, and your diligence could be asking questions. But you're basically using your syndicate lead, you're using the other people who are putting in the 250 K checks, the million dollar checks, you're using them as a proxy for your diligence. And if you're not comfortable with that, totally understand. You want to do firsthand diligence, that's great. But you can't, you can't, we can't have 100 people asking 10 questions each and asking to see bank balances and, you know, legal documents. So you're relying on good faith uh, when you're making small checks and everybody else's diligence. I think it's a pretty good rule. 10% of the round, you can ask new questions. Sure, you're putting in 100 of K six figure investment, it's not chump change of a million dollar round. Great, you're putting in 100k to a $25 million round. Okay, now that 100k is in the same position. Yep. We just don't slow everybody down. We got to move fast here. Um, and it's risk capital, you know, you're taking a risk here. So you, you can't blend it in what what kind of diligence do you find is the most effective 
for you and when you're doing a large portion of the round what what do you focus on with your team in terms of diligence uh well team is me so um, okay uh I, team in singular um uh, you know my, my favorite uh hack is i ask for all the updates they've ever written um because ah. Wow, what a great hack. Because updates like have been such a, I mean, if there's any indication of like the companies that are most successful in my portfolio, it's the ones that write great updates. And then mm -hmm. the ones that I don't get updates from almost invariably have a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the, that's the best. That for me is like, I look for that always. If things are going well, you write updates. Things aren't going well, you try to fix it and then write an update. You know, Travis used to send regular updates of, about Uber, you know, awesome. Alex would send updates about com. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Sometimes the update was like, we grew 72% quarter over quarter. Yeah. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's yeah, all you need to send. And that's good. Yeah, I cool. mean, I literally just had a, a, a CEO take over a company from the founder. They sent an update with no numbers, no charts in it. You know, their personal bio, everything they've done in their career. And it was like, oh, my Lord. And I just wrote them back this morning. And I said, listen. Congrats on the new job. Here's what we need. Yeah. And actually, I'll, 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 this would be interesting. I'm going to read to you what I said to a founder. This will be like a first live read. I'm not going to say the founder's name, but this is my writing. So I'm entitled to do it. Let's see. So here's what I said. Great first update, but a bit heavy on the text and no real metrics. Yeah, I, I'm candid. I got yeah. a big, you know, mm -hmm. seven figure mm -hmm. investment in this. Please send us for Q2 and going forward. Number one, monthly revenue spend and burn in a chart and a table yeah. for the year. Yeah. So folks can see the trend. Yeah. Please include quarterly performance yeah. for the past eight quarters. Again, so folks can see the trend. Yeah. Three, please include our target for the quarter and year and how we are trending toward it. Mm -hmm. Four, headcount. Five, cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. Add up a specific date mm -hmm. and runway based on that. Yeah. Very simple five bullet points there. Yeah. Now, if you're running the company properly, you have, number one, the monthly revenue and spend. Yeah. Your account has given it to you. Yeah. Number two, you have quarterly yeah. because you do board meetings yeah. and you have to show that at the board meeting. Yeah. Number three, you should have targets. If you don't have yeah. targets and you're a series A company, like yeah. what are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. Like if you're an you know, accelerator, yeah. but you know, you don't have customers yet, maybe you don't have targets. Headcount. If you don't know your headcount, you should, you should be able to get that in 10 seconds yeah. and then cash in the bank at a specific date. You just yeah. open up your Bank of America Fair or Wells Fargo, whatever your jam is, and you take a look. Yeah. Yeah. Runway, you look at your last three months burn, you average it. Now you know your runway. This is simple stuff, folks. Yep. Now, the update I got, I kid you not, was over a thousand words. <laughs> so a thousand words, but didn't include any of that. And that makes you terrified mm -hmm. as an investor. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing as a founder, you do need to know when you're scaring the shit out of your investors. And that long, long email yeah. without any numbers means things are screwed in the mind of an investor. We could be wrong, yeah. but that's what we're thinking. Yeah, because if you're going to spend that time writing that email, that's time you're not spending growing the business talking to customers right. working with your team and so like there better be there better be a really good reason why you spent all that time writing all that stuff and why are the numbers not in here yeah number yeah. one you don't know them oh my god you don't know yeah, them yeah, we have a huge problem number two they're disastrous yeah okay they're disastrous isn't that the time to tell us so we can help yeah totally so if it is the second question so if it's the first oh my god you're not qualified to run the company we need to get you help you know coo whatever number two if you're not sharing it with us because you're ashamed i understand that gut reaction you want to make it better just tell us because we might be able to tell you how to make it better because yeah. it's not our first time at the rodeo yeah so really founders please take this in you know if you're if you're not telling the investors we are now in our head then playing out every scenario just like zach and i if we're in a poker hand and zach and i are playing heads up and the board's got two hearts yeah. you know and there's no straight on the board and yeah. zach's raising and i'm raising yeah, okay yeah, so i'm yeah. going well i've got a set ooh, and i've got ooh, top set so trouble. either he's got ooh, the ooh, middle set ooh. or I, I hope i'm on a good draw here or he's on a flesh draw yeah, give me the draw okay and are we <laughs> running it twice like we're now <laughs> handicapping each other's hands and i'm going okay i guess i got to get all my money in here yeah yeah you know, and when we're trying to level each other, we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. We do this for a living with the investments. So when that update comes in, know that Zach and I are saying, why did the founder not include the numbers? Yeah. Is it bad? Do they not know them? Do they need more support? And so, yeah, you got to, your updates have to be tight and tight is right. All right. This is a great question. How do you know if you're good at investing? <laughs> I'm investing <laughs> my own money, one to 6K, been at it three years. A lot of companies are doing very well, but it's all paper. Yeah. 
money? Is it just patience? Yes. What a great question, Eric Weiner. How would you assess yourself in year three, which if we do know the J curve, mm -hmm. and I'll ask my team to pull up a, uh, just do a Google search for angel and J curve or pull up the angel university slide with it. Um, there's a J curve in there. The J curve says you start investing money, your portfolio will be underwater in years two, three, four, before the values start going up. That's the J curve. Mm -hmm. But how do you know in, the, in that specific sophomore junior year? If you're any good at this, you're in shop. I, I mean, I think the short answer is, is it you, you don't, even if, um, mm. everything is going up and to the right and everything is marked up and you've had, like, I had a billion dollar exit 12 months after I started, uh, mm. uh d d that meant nothing. I, there was not an indication that I was good or smart or knew what I was doing. And even now I look at my portfolio and you know, the, the, the meat of the portfolio is a number of companies where I have large ownership stakes and they've become very large businesses, but like, they're still not cashed out. They haven't gone public yet. We mm -hmm. haven't, um, we haven't taken them to the level where they turn into real money. So even eight yeah. years into it, I'm like, I'm, it's pretty clear that I'm on the right trajectory. I'm like on the trajectory level, I'm very good at it, but until I return, you know, five, plus x to my to my um by yep. 10x to my my lps um, um i don't know we'll see here's what i would look at eric just to give you some signals now the j curve will bring it up here you start investing you put this money to work pull up the j curve uh the j cal curve again <laughs> you have management fees you're deploying capital there's not enough time for the rounds to go up so you see here the initial commitment is you know the bar and you have management fees you're investing you know, you sometimes business is shut down. So you can take those losses early. And that means your portfolio by definition is under water. If you were to invest in, uh, let's see, he says he's invested in, uh, he's been at it three years, he's putting that in, we don't have the total number that Eric has invested, but I'm going to just say, let's say Eric's invested in 10 companies. So that's enough to have a little diversification, I would rather see you at 20, let's say. So let's put the number at 20. Yeah. You got 20. That means you got a, a good chance here. You got stuff spread around. And let's say you're only investing in companies that have products in market. And, they, and let's say half of them have revenue, half don't. But this, they have, half of them have products in market. Okay, let's say you get to year two or three here, where you're at. Maybe three or four of the companies, and you, let's say you put, you know, 5k into each. So 20 times 5, 100k. All right, you have four companies that went out of business. They shut down. They had seed funding, it's year three, they couldn't raise another round, they couldn't, they raised the bridge, then they went out of business. So you have negative 20, you can write those companies off. Now let's say three of the companies have raised up rounds, and the other ones are still deploying and have some revenue, but they haven't raised their next round. Very hard to know what's going on here. Yeah. You, you know for sure that you have negative 20. So you're down to 80k of live investments. The top three have raised up rounds, so on paper, they doubled in value. So the 15 of those turned into 30. So you're plus 15. So you're at 95 on paper. Yeah. How do you know? Yeah, you don't. Well, here's how you know. Um, you don't, but you can look for signals of, you know, is the revenue in those top companies growing? Zach said before, I have 700 million in revenue for my investments. Zach is looking at his companies and just saying, what's the revenue of the companies? Not the valuations, the revenue. So there's a proxy. Um, you know, just start looking at the revenue of the actual companies and know about power laws. When this J curve here has that big spike towards the end. Yep. That's representing one to three companies Uber. out of your, yeah, probably two companies out of your 20. So that's what you need to know is focus on the winners. And what does the revenue look like to do a callback? Zach said earlier, hey, I like to plow more money into a company. And I said, well, what's the, the metric for that? And he said, 3x year over year revenue growth. So that's what I would be looking for. You got any 3xers in there? Somebody had 200k this year, they have 600k this year, they had 600k last year, they got 1.7 million this year. That would be the early signs of winning. But truth is you don't. This is why VCs don't get fired. Uh, but in their second or third funds, when the chickens come home to roost in year 10. Yeah. It's a great question. And Eric replied, he had 35 companies about 60k total. Mm -hmm. So you'll know, you'll know, just uh, stick with it. And uh, the more you can invest in like Zach and I like to do, of companies that have launched products and revenue, the less zeros you're going to see. So that would be a healthier portfolio. Now, some people love to invest pre product market fit. I have some friends who do that. God bless them, the world needs them. But my best advice when you're starting out is to play, you know, play the if this is poker, play good cards in position was the best advice I ever got. Andy Duke was like, why are you playing 
810 suited under the gun like are you really going to defend this position when you get a raise and a re-raise you're probably going to toss these cards so you just wasted that blind so just think that through play better cards play less cards play in position that's what we're talking about here anything to add to that zach it's great let's take another question from our amazing audience what's the best question we got right now zeb asks as a founder when should you provide pro rata to angels and when not okay oh, so this yeah, is yeah. not from our side of the table, yeah. this is in the founders. I like the way you phrased yeah. the question, Zeb. As a founder, yeah. should you give pro rata to angels or not? Yeah. So, so I argue the you should you should giving pro rata. You should only you should only ever agree to giving pro rata if you're forced to. In best case scenario, no one should ever have pro rata. But basically, you should as a founder, you should have you should always have some amount of the allocation of the next round. Usually, I would argue ten percent or more that you get to allocate however you want to whoever's mm -hmm. most useful and most helpful to you, the company. And I see this all the time where a new VC will come in and they'll say, no, nope, no extra allocation for any of the existing investors. And when that happens, mm -hmm. I send them an email. I'm like, look, I've done this amount of work for this company. I brought in this and director of engineering. Yep. I brought in this salesperson. And from now on, I'm done. I am no longer working for this business and you will get no more help from me. And by the way, I'm never going to send you another, another deal again. And so, so you. Okay. you take, you, you take like, a wartime stance. Oh yeah. yeah. Like when you me do too. that to me, Same here. like if you cut me out of the round dead to me. that I've been in from the beginning, like let's go, I'm, I'm you're dead to me and we're done. Swords out. And let's go. By the way, this company, and I, I, I make sure the founders on the email, like, like I love you, but like, I no longer have an incentive to keep investing in, in the business, my time and energy, yeah. if I don't get to keep investing my capital. And so like you, and I think every founder should have the ability to reward the useful angels. And if you're free riding, like if they, if you're an angel and you come on board and you write a check and then you just, you're done, you're not helping at all. Well, you shouldn't get any more allocation. And so I don't think it should be contractual pro rata. I think it should be rewarded pro rata. Earned, earned, earned pro rata. Yeah. I like, I like your approach. I think as a founder, that's in your best interest. Um, and for me as an investor, I take a very simple approach. We own over 5%. We get a board observer seat. We have pro rata. We own over 10%. We get a full board seat. That's basically where I've wound up with what I think is fair. And I make it an option. I'm unique as a early stage investor. I, I know my value. I know I could bring value to the table. And then every time I've had this come up where somebody tries to take away our board, right? Or whatever, yeah. or take away our pro rata. I just get on the phone with them. In fact, I'm doing one of these calls today or tomorrow yeah. where some new investor you know, they're putting in 10%, we own 9% or 11%. And they're like, Yeah, we don't want them on the board. They're, you know, whatever, no pro rata for them. And then I just talk to them. And I say exactly what you just discussed. Hey, and I and I tell the founders this, I actually give the founders a preemptive discussion about this. Hey, know this when we get to the next round, somebody might try to screw us. If they screw us, there's only one person left to screw. That's you the founder. We are in this together. Yep. We're always going to have your back. Yep. So therefore, when people come to screw us, you should fight for us because having us on your board, having us as a major shareholder means we're going to fight for you. Yep. And then every subsequent investor should be joining that philosophy. We fight for each other. Yep. So this, the seed round lead and the series A fight together to find a series B who respects the series A and the C. Yep. And then we all build consensus. And I, I got to tell you, one of the beautiful things is looking at density or other wins, calm. Everybody has been respectful. And, you know, we you're able to have this great board dynamic where the seed investor, the series A, the series B, and then people are like, Oh, we don't want to have too big of a board. The lawyers come up with all these or, or, and the series A people come up with all these, you know, rules. And it's like, uh, board can be seven, it could be five doesn't matter what a board of five, five, where it's three from the series A or two from the series A, uh, you know, is not as good actually, as one from the series A one from the seed, no. I would argue the seed investors who've been with the company longer might have a lot to add here. So therefore, like everybody chill out and think about the value. I love your framing. It's great framing who's providing value and give them the reward. Yeah. And you know, the no free rides is great. Now, if you're an angel on the other side of the table, if you're not a major investor, you can try to get you're within your right to ask for pro rata. Yeah. But if you're under 5% or 10% of the round, should you really get it? Mm. Well, they, you know, well, I like when they get it, but yeah. you know, I, I understand that they they really don't have the standing. And then just have the debate on what a major investor is. The major investor rights, you know, generally start at twenty five percent of the round. So if it's a million dollar round, two fifty. If it's a two million dollar round, five hundred. Seems reasonable to me. A two hundred fifty k check's a lot of money. So maybe it's a hundred k. Maybe it's two hundred fifty k. I think you really should 
you know, negotiate that uh, in good faith. And I love your approach, Zach. Anything to add to that? Oh, the only thing I would say is that like, it, like if you can help the founder in the fundraise process, like mm -hmm. very early on, help review the deck, help with introductions to other investors, help listen yeah. to the pitch and give them feedback. Um, that keeps you in pole position to be useful as that round progresses. And so one thing I will often do is when they're getting ready to raise, the first thing I'll be like, I'm in for a million bucks. And it's on an email. I'm going to let you know right now. And by the way, you can tell all the new investors that I'm in at a million bucks already. And so that helps them when they're going out fundraising because basically they know they're like, Hey, I'm raising money and we already have Zachy's in and these other investors are in. And like, so this is, we are, this is already going to be a competitive round. And that helps in the process to make sure that then I don't get screwed by the new investors. Um, so ball control, you're never going to have ball control. The founder has ball control. But if you're there ready to help them and support them in that process, you're going to be in a much better spot. All right. Tom S. A question uh, that's a really hard one. Have you ever advised a founder to leave the CEO role? Ooh. Have you ever advised a founder that they should give up the CEO role? I have had the discussion with a founder multiple times mm -hmm. when either they were being pushed by a board or they were considering it themselves. So I have had the conversation and I'm trying to think if my advice was ever to do it. Have you ever advised, uh, advised a founder to leave the CEO slot? I've, I've never had to proactively do it, but I've had the conversation with people about it. I've not, I've not. What would it take for you to advise a founder that, hey, maybe the CEO slot's not for you? What would, what would it have to look like? Just incompetence. Um, okay. But I have, I have told the companies that I've lost faith and I'm like, just, just let you know, I no longer believe in the directions you're going and I don't believe that you're going to be able to achieve it. That doesn't mean I'm right. I, I'm not, I don't have my hands on the metal. I don't have full visibility into everything that's going on. I don't understand your space as well as you do. It doesn't mean I'm right. It, but it does mean that I will no longer be investing in the business. And I be, I'm be, I have become a passive investor and I'm along for the ride. Um, and so you'll be clear with them about oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that. Why do you do that? For people who don't understand why you're taking the time to be that frank, that candid with the founder, why do you do that? Because I strongly believe in my view of where they're, where they're at and what they're doing and where they're going. And I'm like, I don't think this is right. And I'm now going to tell you how strongly I believe this. And so that you Fine. can understand that when you take my opinion into your calculus. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones making the decision. They have more information than I do. They're closer to the sure. metal. They they're gonna they have to make the best decision they can make. And so me putting sort of my um my my stake in the ground there, I think is helpful in that process. And um I've only had to do it a couple of times. Do you ever times. ask them to buy you out in that situation or offer that? Like, hey, listen, I don't want to be dead weight on the cap table. If you want to buy me out in the next round, that's what I, I have done that, yeah. I I, ha yeah, I had I've a round that. where it was David Sachs uh was competing oh. against another VC firm. And uh, mm -hmm. the other VC firm was really well, it came in with a bunch of like really silly ideas, but they overpaid. And I was like, I was like, look, I think this is a big mistake. Uh, I'm not participating in this round because I don't feel like the direction these guys are going. And I don't, I don't think this makes, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and uh, by the way, if you want to buy me out, I'm okay with that. I think you should go with Sax. I think the direction he wants to go with you is better. Yep. Uh, but they made the choice they made. Uh, they didn't buy me out. I'm along for the ride. The company's doing well, but uh, they, I think Sax would have taken them further and faster. But you know, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, hard to say no to Sax. Yeah, it I, seems I, like I think the guy you want on your team. Yeah. Mm. yeah this uh, perfect company for him too. Like he, he was yeah. literally personally going to join the board. I was like. What are you guys doing? Like that just yeah, doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it's very rare to get a legendary guy on your board like that. Mm. I, mm, it's kind of a hard one to turn down. Have you read? Um, uh, have you read the new uh, book about PayPal called The Founders? Um, I haven't read it yet, uh, but Sachs bought the rights to it for a movie. You guys, so. a good book, and Sachs is. Oh, a you know what I'm reading right now is book. The, He's like, I, I oh, wonder really? if he, um, if he, uh, I have pulled a, some nefarious. Yeah. To make sure that he got the hero uh, card in there because he looks uh, yeah, so you good know in that that's book. history is written by the victors yeah, exactly <laughs> and for the people who underwrite yeah, it treated by the book yeah, rights yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, kind of hard yeah. i don't know what happened there if you buy the movie rights of the book do you get a little I, extra I, shine I, maybe, in the book maybe because he looks maybe like a genius a all the way shine. through that book i mean he you is know, a genius caprio playing david Sachs in the yeah <laughs> Leo. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting i'm reading a book called the power law which oh, i am i'm almost done with i recommend to everybody um, it's a good listen. It's got one of those like really professional folks. I it basically goes through like the history of venture capital. It feels like uh, it wasn't primary research. It feels like they took all of the existing books out there yeah. 
and they just made a nice package. It's almost like a history channel, like yeah. overview of yeah. the industry, but it's a good one. Yeah. And it's very simple and it's very to the point. And it really explains like chapter by chapter, each of the uh, seminal moments in the history of the Valley, you know, Kleiner with yeah. Ellen Powell, but Kleiner before that with Tom Perkins mm -hmm. and his reign. Mm -hmm. And it really goes into the, dynam the dynamics of Founders Fund and how it was formed. It goes into the Facebook, Meshugana showing up in pajamas. Mm -hmm. it, it's all rehashed stuff. I, I didn't find anything new in it. Uh, for me, there, but there were a couple of stuff in the early days of venture that I was aware of. But the fact that they streamed together in like 15 chapters, each of the moments in history um, was very reinforcing to me. It was like somebody making an abstract on the history of venture capital and being like, here's what you need to know. Yeah. These are the 15 important stories. So it's kind of like a best of, you know, like one of those, like, you know, what it remind me of is like the nineties, you know, like VH1 yeah, does yeah, the nineties. Yeah, 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 and it's yeah, like, yeah, if you, yeah. if you weren't there for it, here's Nirvana. Yeah. Here's what you need to know about Pearl Jam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's, here's smashing pumpkins. And it's a it's a good book in that way. Uh, so I recommend it to anybody who's starting off in, in, in VC as a as a as a good book to catch up. And uh, they do go into the whole formation of Founders Fund and the whole fight between Moritz mm. and Sean Parker mm. and Ruloff coming in. Wow. I, I haven't finished it. Somebody told me I mentioned towards the end. Um, and they also go into the forming of Y Combinator, which I knew but it was good to sort of hear even more about it. Um, and just remember that moment in time, I think they had a big impact. They don't talk about angel list which i guess maybe you know they they kind of stopped talking about stuff in the 2010 range but i think angel list has had such a profound and syndicates has such a profound impact that it's changing but they talk a lot about angels and super angels mm -hmm. so they talk a little bit about ron conway mm -hmm. and his role in all of this um so i i think it's uh, pretty great in terms of back to the original question of advisor uh, the ceo so the reason i bring that up is because they talk a lot about removal of the ceo mm -hmm. And that ended with Larry and Sergey. That was like kind of the last time it happened. And then Founders Fund said, we're going to just let the founders as awkward as they are run these companies. For me, what would it take? Um, malfeasance, like mm -hmm. doing something illegal. Yeah. Um, I've had this situation a couple of times where, you know, founders would do something with the cap table that was like, whoa, yeah. that's maybe illegal. Yeah. And certainly Delaware law would pounce on you. Like we're going to all get sued situation. Yeah. And in those cases, I do ask, hey, just please buy me out yeah. and get me off the cap table. Yeah. Uh, in one case, I just said, you know, this company is now two years old. You can buy me out at cash I put in yeah. and I'll move on. Literally don't need to have a gain on it. Mazel tov, I can put the money to work somewhere else. And so I think that's what I try to do is if I really disagree, you don't need me or I could become, um, I'll sell half my shares, get me to under 5%. Don't need my board of server seat. Just semi quarterly updates is what i ask and then i i try to make that contractual that'll get quarterly updates on the way out because you really do want people to live up to that expectation as we heard let's take a final question because here we are we got zach is zach you're in the zone today really appreciate you, you uh, coming here just, just drafting off of you bro you're always in the zone uh, uh, it's uh well, easiest, easiest. i just do this for a living but you're yeah. a pro obviously that's it that's it that's it i just i enjoy our time together because it makes me a little mentally sharper oh, um, thank you thank you you're so generous well, well, let, me, let me ask you a question how long do you think the down market is going to be and what's your strategy as an investor as we go into let's just say the first two quarters were uh, let's say if we are in fact in a recession yeah. we're close to it i think we all agree that that's the likely scenario so first half of the year two sequential quarters of either da of down market in all likelihood we'll find out what q2 is crazy interest obviously a pullback late stage sure. investors are gone what is zach coleus's strategy going into the next six months, the second half of 2022, and then more importantly, into 2023. What's your strategy? So I have, We're playing I, in a high stakes poker game here. Yeah, What's yeah, your strategy? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've got a hundred million dollars of capital I got to put to work. That's a, that's a very high stakes yeah. poker game that I play in. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's much higher stakes than I can afford to play with real money with my, at least yeah. my, my, my cash money. Um, for now. Yeah, we'll see. It's uh, so far. Hey, so turn that 100 into 500, you get 20% of the um, gain. You know, you could be sitting so, on 80 million. So far, I'm nice. doing very well. We'll see if it yeah. keeps going that way. I got to love this game. I got a couple of companies I want to see IPO, and then uh, that I'll be, oh, I'll such be a great feeling. Let me tell you. Um, Let me tell you. Yeah. Such a great feeling. Um, um, so, so I, I think about life, I think about all these things as a duality. Like, um, and, and there's there's two approaches to this, and they're both they're kind of kind of separate. Um, from a macro perspective, I I feel like there is a ton of dumb stuff that got done over the last ten years 
that is going to get wrung out as interest rates go up. Uh, that's going to lead to a recession. I, I think it's like, it's just so much like just silly expansion and just dumb investment that is going to lead to significant downturns globally. So like you look at the mm. Chinese real estate market, like, I mean that they're going through wor that workout process and it's going to be long and slow and painful. Um, when you have Jamie Dimon, who I think is literally one of the smartest uh, people in the world saying, Hey guys, the pain is here. It's coming. I, I listen to people like that. And like when the best capital allocators in the world, Bezos and Musk were selling uh, at the end of last year, I was watching that being like, uh oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, sounds uh -oh. right. Um, so, so, yeah, I personally believe that like we have a lot more pain coming. I, I just finished reading Paul Volcker's book about sort of the late 70s and early 80s. And like I, it was just really eye opening to me the amount of pain uh, that, that they went through during that period. And it's funny, like you hmm. look at San Francisco. It, it's very, which one is that changing fortunes uh, it's called or, um uh keeping at it keeping at it um yeah uh, good, good good book uh and it's funny if you look at basically like san francisco it's very analogous to new york in the 60s new york and D detroit in the 60s which is that it was like boom times everybody was rich and uh everyone was just building big buildings and everyone was just feeling how awesome they were the nifty 50 were on fire and so you ended up with this very progressive leadership in both of those cities that as the general market downturn in the coming into the seventies led to the hollowing out of both New York and Detroit in a significant mm. way. Uh, I mean, San Francisco is following that to a T. I mean, absolutely to a T. And so I, I feel like we could have a lot of pain in front of us. That said, uh, I'm an early stage investor and I look for companies that are doing new new things that like that it's not going into an established market they're trying to basically yeah. bring push a button we get a car level sort of like oh my god i want that immediately sort of new stuff and that's a 10-year mm. play and so and it's rare for me to see those companies they don't come along very often and when i find them i'm going to back up the truck and buy as much of them as i can thankfully now at much lower prices than i would have had to pay you know a year or two later but i'm very 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 scared about follow-on capital Two years ago, mm. a year ago, there was no such thing as fall on capital risk. Everything was getting funded. Like, you know, across my portfolio, I have over 60 businesses. We only had one bankruptcy. And that's because everything kept getting funded. It's just like money, 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 money. And now yeah. I'm scared of that. I think we're going to see mm. a significant number of these companies who will raise a seed round and that will not be able to raise series A's and that will go out of business. And so that is where I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about, which is like, can the follow-on capital support these guys as they go forward? Because mm. uh, me or someone else, because I'm not, I'm not depending on the next investor. Yeah, uh, yeah I have a similar strategy. I'll probably deploy more capital, uh, or I'm hoping to deploy more capital into more deals uh, in the coming year than I have ever done nice. in my career. Nice. And uh, you know, my thinking is the valuations will be reasonable once again, and the number and the founders who are operating and able to get to you know, their first customer, not zero to one in the Peter Thiel sense, yeah. but zero to one in zero paid customers, one paid customer. That is a huge jump, mm -hmm. like getting somebody to put their credit card in huge jump. If I can find those companies, they've got the one paying customer, two paying customers, they got the five to $15 million valuation, they've got the three to 10 employees. And I make that bet mm -hmm. uh, in a down market when other people don't want to, yeah. I've got a founder who's resilient, mm -hmm. and clever enough, resourceful enough. So resourceful and resilient founders who have their product in market with a customer. Yep. That's where I'm putting yep. my energy. Yep. And if you don't have a customer yet, or you're still working on your product, that's fine. But I have some people who built a no code solution and got to five customers. Yeah. Okay, so they literally have no coding experience. Yeah. But they took bubble or Webflow or notion plus Zapier plus if this then that plus Airtable, whatever glue they did, mm -hmm. and they duct taped something together and they delighted three customers. Yeah. I'm going to take that person yeah, totally over the person who theatrically gives me the best pitch in the world. Yeah, yeah. I just need people who can build mm -hmm. and are resilient and resourceful because you're, you're literally going out into the open ocean in a yeah, storm. Yeah. I mean, you're literally yeah. going into a maelstrom yeah. and I need a MacGyver out yeah. there on that boat. Yeah. I need people who can look at the re the, the, the rations and say, here's how we're going to ration this. Here's how we're going to get to the new world. Here's how we're going to survive. We know how to get water from the sails. We know how to kill seagulls or yeah, yeah, yeah. we know how to fish. Yeah, yeah. You know, I need you to survive. Yeah. 
if you don't got survival skills and you go try to do a Shackleton type thing, yeah, you're, you're going to be on day two yeah. and you're going to be curled up in a ball yeah. on the lower deck asking for your mommy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I, I can't have those founders. Yeah, yeah. I need the resourceful ones. All right, this has been amazing. Everybody follow uh, Zach on the social media, Zach Coleus. Uh, amazing job as always. And uh, he's pretty active on the Twitter. That's a great place to find him. He likes to invest in companies like I do that have resourceful founders who build great products that have some amount of traction. You know, email us both. Yeah. Email us both if you got, yeah, you yeah. know, what we just described. And, uh, you know, we'll co-lead you around. You got a SaaS company, you got 25k in revenue. That's 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 the kill zone for Zach and I, right? All that's where long. we're coming in hot. All we're long. coming in hot with an offer. So let's get a deal going here. Right. Let's get a deal. Every time we do this, we're trying to find a deal. So email us. What's your best email that you uh, like so to it's give Z out? At colius.bc. Uh -huh. Okay. And I'm Jason at calicanus.com. Uh email the two of us and say, hey, here's a here's a Jay-Z deal. <laughs> That'd be J awesome. Get a Jay-Z deal going. That would be awesome. uh, hashtag us Jay-Z deals. All right, we'll see all you right. all next time on This Week in Star Wars. Bye-bye, Zach. Thank you.